everyone. Thanks for coming in. Uh, welcome to the Sports Analytics Conference again. Um, my name is Nick Holmes. I'm a first year LGO at MIT Sloan, and we're glad to have you here. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the panel, Ensembling and, Wis and Wisdom of Crowds. Please join me in welcoming our speakers, Professor and Senior Associate Dean for Professional Degree Programs, University of Virginia Darden School of Business, Yael Grushka Kokain and the Assistant Professor of Quantitative Analysis at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business, Michael Albert. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. Thank you guys for braving the weather and for being here uh, early on a Saturday morning, a uh, small but mighty group. Uh, I will say this is titled as a workshop and we intend it to be that way, so we encourage you first to move forward if you can. Uh, at some point, Michael will be walking you through and giving you an opportunity to uh, play around with a Jupyter notebook with some data, uh, see some code, win some prizes, uh, get, get, you know, get all excited and invested. So we encourage you to participate as much as you feel comfortable after you're done with the coffee. I will entertain you a little bit, keep the conversation going, and then I'll pass it over to, to Michael. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here this morning and excited to see this group um, to talk about something that I'm very passionate about and um, relates to my research. So my background is not in sports. I will put that out there early on, okay? Um, but I do come from um, uh, the area of decision analysis and I do a lot of my work on forecasting and the wisdom of the crowd. And I think it's very relevant to the analytics and a lot of the machinery that you all might be coming across in various contexts. So we're gonna take a little bit of a journey outside of the world of sports. Don't worry, it will only be for like 20 minutes, okay? Um, and kind of be inspired by a slightly different context to think about the principles that relate to the wisdom of crowd. And then we're gonna bring it back to sports and that will be um, the second half, uh, the improved second half of the talk. Okay, so does that sound like a good, a good plan? Okay, so um, I'm not gonna dwell about us because we got such a nice introduction, but if you need to, um, and please, please, please do uh, reach out to us on LinkedIn or connect with us outside. Both Michael and I do work um, that m might be relevant to problems that you are either worried about, concerned about, puzzled about, or, or, or wanna just dig in deeper. And as some of you know, we write cases, case studies for, um, for our, um, as part of our, our job, um, in the University of Virginia at the Darden School, we teach with cases, 100% with cases, we don't lecture, and so we're always looking for a good case, um, so please come knocking on our doors with your problems. So that's all I'll say in terms of our background um, in, a, you know, in a true wisdom of crowd fashion. Anything else you guys are curious about before I move on? Ask anything, wake, a, wake us up a little bit. I need the audience to kind of wake up. What are you curious about? Okay, what the crowd has to do with that, right? Okay, good, so you're, you're curious more to know about decision making and what the crowd has to do about that, you sir? Same, okay? We need diversity, well, that's one thing we'll learn about a crowd, okay? Some other aspect, anything else that's interesting to you first thing in the morning? You gentlemen in the back? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. So we'll talk a little bit about some of these aspects, both decision-making in crowds uh, and how we can use this uh, to relate to crowds more, more generally. But I'm gonna start, as I mentioned, from the context of economic forecasts, okay? So I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of a background about a different context, and then uh, we will, over the talk, extrapolate to other, uh, other environments. So some of you may be familiar with the uh, Wall Street Journal um, survey of economic forecasting. How many of you have heard about this before? Okay, a few, quite a few. Um, some of you may know that not only the Wall Street Journal, but the Philadelphia Fed, actually many different organizations, the ECB in, in Europe, uh, the European Central Bank, a lot of different organizations routinely collect forecasts from various economists, uh, either academics or practitioners, on a regular basis, either monthly, quarterly, annually, and they keep track of their performance. Now, let's immediately go to Azar. Our, Azar, Azar's question. How does that relate to decision making? So, like for instance, does anybody have an example of a decision that you use uh, forecasts from the, these kinds of surveys for? Anybody in there? Yeah, go ahead. 
Okay, you answered your own question. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so real perfect. So, so in the context of insurance, you often look at these types of surveys to think about what the economy is going to do. Okay, specifically, any one indicator that you care about? Okay, so GDP, GDP growth is one of the big indicators. Other examples of decisions that you might all uh, rely, or decisions that you make in the context of your environment that might rely on forecasts from this survey. Does anybody have another example? Yeah. Oh yes, okay, good, good. So looked at the survey to think about what do you do in terms of a personal choice? Do I continue to be a student? Is there gonna be a recession? What is the chance of a recession? What is inflation gonna do? Maybe some uh, folks look at the, the housing market. There are a lot of various indicators that are useful directly to decision making. And so these surveys can be super, super helpful. Okay, so that's our starting point. Now, the Wall Street Journal also loves to celebrate the most accurate forecasters, okay? So once a year, there's a beautiful picture. In the past, it was actually like hand-drawn, you know, like a, like, an anim, like a little bit of a painting or picture. Uh, this is just a picture of, of Mr. Bernard here. Um, uh, and they really kind of splurge and, and pr present these top forecasters in a prominent position on their website um, and celebrate their success. Okay, the top forecaster for 2018, and they tell us a little bit about their background and where they're from. Um, and in this case, uh, Mr. Bernard was the chief economist from uh, the Economic Outlook Group. Um, and they even show us a little bit about how he did in terms of his forecasts compared to the realization. So the realization, I believe, is in the dark blue in the top. Then we have Bernard, we have the Fed, so they compare him to the Fed's forecast, and they compare him to the average of the Wall Street Journal, okay? So they're showing us the top forecaster, and in this coverage, they're comparing him to the average. Now, this is a few years old. This is 2018, I believe, so it was published in 19. Uh, since COVID, they's, they've been a little bit more discreet. Um, I'm, I can have, I have a few hypotheses as to why, uh, but, but we're gonna just use Bernard as an example, okay? So when you're looking to go back to school or to your job, or if you're looking related to the insurance decisions, do we trust Bernard? Wow, you guys are a tough crowd, first thing in the morning, okay? So I see some kind of skepticism. I will say, I don't know if you can see this because it's a little bit in grayscale, but another thing that they do on the screen, uh, in this article, aside from tell us a little bit about him and his background and his experience, they also compare him to a few others. So they, they have Mr. Bernard as the top forecaster, but they compare him to Beth Ann Bavino. She was at SMP for a while, and she was the previous winner from the previous year. And then they compare him to uh, uh, three others that together they form the top five forecasters from 2018, okay? So more information. And again, after I present that, if you're not convinced, I want to ask you, do you trust his forecast? Like, is he a good person to rely on? Does he have a good forecasting? Whatever he does with whatever crystal ball he has, is he a good forecaster for us to rely on? Why not? Why? Okay, so first it's one person, okay, so, but you said a few things there. You said it's one person, so you don't like relying on one person versus the crowd. Um, and you also said something else. Did you guys hear what else he doubted? Not only the fact that it's one person. Small it's a small sample, meaning what? Okay, so maybe, we, maybe it's okay to go with one per person, but we would need more data in order to establish that, okay? So we're really saying we wanna know that maybe he's performing in a certain way before we decide to, to trust him. So two things kind of at play here, putting all of our eggs in one basket, meaning trusting one specific forecaster, even though his picture's in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and then also we wanna know some track record. Okay, so I don't really have a track record for him, for Mr. Uh, Bernard here, but I do have some kind of summary table of a few years just to kind of pick up on some trends here because could it be under certain circumstances that if he were performing consistently well, you would be okay with him? 
More than just one year. OK, more likely. So if I showed you a track record, maybe you would be OK with it. OK, so here's a historical. This goes back a few years. But let me show you what's on this table. Again, I'm trying to tease out some intuition here for how, we, how to think about our forecasts and who do we trust, a single expert, or maybe use a different strategy, a different heuristic. And so here are, um, there's a list here of five past winners, meaning five top forecasters. Each one of these had not only a picture, a video sometimes, Beth Ann Bovino's interview is notorious. All of these you can find on the Wall Street Journal. They were celebrated top forecasters and their years. So 2010 to 2014, every year we had a top forecaster. And I'm showing you their track record. So I can, in the columns, basically you see how well each one of these forecasters did um, over the same kind of window uh, of time. So what do you notice? OK, so a lot, even though they're all one at some point, we have those top uh, predictions, even though at some point they were number one, they fluctuate quite a bit. OK, good. What else do you notice? Yeah, so the duo, interestingly, the only for, uh, team that submits as a, as a team, as a duo, um, seem to be at least consistently in the top, okay? And so there is some stability there that comes from them. So maybe just go with them. Would you trust them instead of any, uh, anybody else? OK, so maybe they're also very close. So not only ranking these predictions and ranking their performance, but also understanding how, better, how much better is the, the top one versus maybe some of the, uh, the others. OK, but from this, we can start to see some tension here and some nuances. And we can start to hypothesize and generate new heuristics in terms of forming that forecast. Remember, we want to look at these surveys, look at their predictions, and walk away confident that we have a good forecast. And so our go-to heuristic or maybe kind of like having it out there as always a strategy would be what? What would a strategy be? We can take the top forecaster. I'm going to call that strategy chasing the expert. Go with the top forecaster versus what would be an alternative? Take the average. Okay, average, everybody. Okay, take the average. Okay, so the average, which we typically label wisdom of the crowd, we mean averaging and Michael will elaborate on the fact that we don't necessarily always have to average in order to benefit from the crowd. But for now, I'm going to focus on wisdom of the crowd as an average. The average, I can take these type five, I can take all 67 uh, predictions that go into the survey, and I can average them. Okay? Why do we think the average will work better or will work good? Why might the average carry some benefits? What is the intuition? Yes. Less variance, what do you mean? OK, so if I take an average, it seems like I'm benefiting from multiple performances. And so they may not be as extreme in the results. OK, so maybe the performance of the average will be more stable over time. OK, good. We'll talk about that, too. Why else does the average intuitively? I mean, we know the average works. We're all using it. I suspect many of you rely on the wisdom of crowd. You use ensemble models. You see it everywhere. Why does it work? Let me give you a little bit of intuition why it works. It turns out it's a simple principle. It's not new. It might seem obvious, but it's so obvious that it's important to kind of highlight, OK? Because by the way, I'll already uh, share some, one anecdote, is that it's interesting that it's very powerful and it works very often, but there are extreme circumstances where it will not work. So if we understand why it works, we will also be more savvy to understand when it won't, OK? Or we will also be able to set the scene to ensure that it works better than not. So the reason that averaging can help us is a really kind of simple arithmetic insight, OK? And this is not insight that necessarily I derived. Um, a lot of the terminology that I'll be using here, I give credit to Jack Soul and Rick Larrick from uh, Duke University, from the Fuqua um, School of Business, that kind of published a few papers about 10 years ago, maybe a, a, a yeah, 10, 12 years ago, that they, they coined these terms, 
that are very helpful for us to think about why averaging hel uh, helps and understand the, the technicalities behind it. So it turns out that averaging helps because in some circumstances, forecasts, and bear with me because this term in the sports arena means something different, uh, forecasts bracket the truth, okay? And so what do I mean by bracket the truth? I'm talking a different use of the term bracketing, okay? We bracket the truth. I'm looking at two forecasts. Let's say I'm forecasting the weather. I'm from Virginia, so I'm gonna talk about Charlottesville because the weather there is nicer than here. So let's assume that I'm forecasting the weather in Charlottesville and I have two experts that tell me either 55 or 62. Let's talk about tomorrow midday. I wanna go for a run, okay? It turns out that if these forecasters bracket the truth, meaning the truth falls in between them, so they are bracketing the truth, meaning they fall on the two different sides of the truth, it turns out that instead of choosing one of them at random, because I don't really know which one of them is better, so instead of putting all of my eggs in one of their baskets and relying on one of them, I will be better off averaging them. And I'll quickly show that to you. It's, again, very simple kind of arithmetic here. If I take their average, this is their average, just their average forecast, okay? If I take, uh, if I look at their individual errors, George is missing the truth by three, Clay is missing, missing the truth by four. On average, that means that my, if I had to randomly choose one of them, my error would be three and a half. If I, that was my best strategy. But looking at the average, obviously I'm missing by only a half a degree. So I got closer. So the moment we have experts that bracket the truth, I immediately benefit from averaging them because my error, as opposed to taking one of them randomly, my error will go down. So far, so good? Now, not under, not, not under all circumstances do the experts bracket the truth. So in some circumstances, it could be that they fall on the same side of the truth, okay? So in this circumstance, if tomorrow was unusual, and by the way, this swing in the weather these days, it's very plausible that we're gonna see 70 tomorrow in Charlottesville. So, but in this case, both of them come, fall on one side. They're not bracketing the truth under this circumstance. So what happens here? Well, I can still average their forecasts, and if I look at the same kind of m simple math that I did before, George misses now by 15, Clay misses by eight, their average misses by 11 and a half, and my average also misses by 11 and a half. The beauty of this is that now, since they do not bracket, averaging actually mathematically does nothing. It basically gives me the same kind of random error, but I've lost nothing either. So when they bracket, I benefit. When they don't bracket, I didn't lose. So the idea of ensembling, or the, the idea of the wisdom of crowd, really benefits or picks up and benefits in cases when they bracket. So what does that mean? What do I need in order for the wisdom of the crowd, the averaging, to be a useful strategy? What would bracketing mean? Yeah. Yes, so I need a decent mix, so I need, and we liked, this is uh, very near and dear to my heart because this is diversity, okay? It's another take on diversity. It's diversity in this context where I need diversity of opinions. I need some kind of diversity of opinions and, and dis dispersion in order for us to bracket the truth every once in a while. And it turns out that that's really one very important property for the wisdom of the crowd, to, that we need to ensure that there is some kind of diversity among our forecasters. Yes. And that's exactly right. So there are circumstances, and you're already kind of actually taking us to exactly the next level of, uh, of, of what I wanted to talk about. We need diversity, but in some circumstances we won't have it, okay? In theory, diversity benefits the average of crowd. There is one other property that we care about when we bring together these experts. So we have a bunch of forecasters. I'm gonna look for diverse forecasters because then I'll benefit from their average, uh, averaging them out. Why might also be a good property for our forecasters? Okay, so independence relates a little bit to the, to the diversity, although not, not necessarily um, uh, guaranteed, okay? Good, so we want independent and diverse uh, forecasters. And we also want them, to be honest, if we can, to get them to be knowledgeable. I mean, 
Bernard, Beth Ann, Paul and Tom, uh, uh, Gil and Tom, the duo, like they all have some domain expertise, okay? So it turns out that there's two properties that will tell me something about the quality of the crowd, but will also tell me when I might wanna put my trust in the crowd versus when I actually might want to chase a single expert, okay? And so if I think about it, these two factors, I can think about one dimension, I'm a business school professor, I gotta have a two by two. Okay, this is what we need to have on all slides. So I'll get it out of the way and then Michael won't have to have a two by two. You don't have a two, I don't. No, okay, fine, okay, good. So um, we think about the wisdom of the crowd. There are four domains that we may wanna start to use, average the forecasts, and there are some domains in which we may want to chase the expert, meaning that there could be circumstances where no longer the averaging help and a single expert would be beneficial. Maybe instead of averaging, I just wanna trust Clay, okay? Maybe I just wanna go with Clay. So if I go back to my mapping here, what are those properties? What are those circumstances? Where do you think, actually let me just save us all time. It turns out three of these four quadrants, you're better off taking the crowd, averaging, and in one quadrant, you're better off chasing the expert. So my question to you all would be, which one of these four cells you're better off chasing the expert? Meaning we're here to learn about the wisdom of crowd. The wisdom of crowd is a super powerful phenomenon, but there are extreme circumstances where the wisdom of crowd doesn't help us as much. Why? It's, so the intuition here is not trivial, okay? The intuition here is not trivial, and let me explain why. The only circumstance where I want to chase the expert, where I want to put all my eggs on a single forecast, and again, remember, forecasts, I use the economic forecasting as the backdrop, but we're gonna move very quickly into sports forecasting. I, I wanna use a single model or a single expert when I know, when there is a, enough dispersion and expertise that I know that that single expert, that one, is really superior, okay? So Clay would have to dominate George routinely and by a fair amount for me to trust Clay because of all the reasons that we heard of before. Because he might be volatile, because there could be uh, various instances that I don't wanna put all my eggs in one basket. But under all the other circumstances, it will be beneficial for me to use the wisdom of the crowd. And it turns out that even a little bit of diversity is enough to kind of pull, pull that away from chasing the expert. So diversity turns out to be a very strong component. This bracketing idea, bracketing the truth, seems to be, be a very strong enabler and a very strong component that will allow me to benefit from averaging more and more and more. But it is on us to understand what environment are we operating in. And going back to ma'am, what was your name? Nadine. Nadine. Going back to Nadine's uh, issue around herding, you can see exactly where herding comes into play. So in the low diversity, column, that's all those instances where people herd. If people are herding but they're all about the same, it's still okay to average them. If people are herding but they're always like chasing Nate Silver's predictions, like if it's Nate versus the rest of the world and everybody's just using his, then you're better off actually going just with him, okay? So like the herding phenomenon is gonna be important in how we think about whether or not to use the expert or the crowd, and it's enough that we discourage a little bit and we have people Yes, going for those tails more often that we're better off to take the average, okay? Um, this is a chart that just kind of summarizes and the data is available. I have a case study on this if you're interested where we show over time that this plays out with the data from uh, the Wall Street Journal, from the Philadelphia Fed. And I know that there's a lot going on here. All this is trying to show with the blue line versus the red line is that the blue line is the performance of the crowd over time. The red line is the performance of chasing the expert over time. When I use last year's expert, I get dinged very, every, um, actually pretty frequently because indeed the volatility is high. When I use and trust the crowd, it is robust, meaning it, yes, there's still error, but it's fairly flat compared to the red, okay? Again, building that intuition that you all had here as to why the wisdom of crowd works. I'm gonna segue um, and allow Michael to come up and entertain you with a different context, but I just wanna say, and I don't know if we provide these slides. Do we provide these slides? Do we provide the slides? Maybe, maybe not. 
If you guys want, I'm happy to send them to you after the fact. But there are various examples here where uh, this is used around us. It was used in COVID all the time in terms of coming up with ensemble models. Um, it is definitely used uh, for hur hurricane predictions. I mentioned the economic forecasting um, and the like um, and various other contexts and even in uh, diversity of you know, the research that we're doing right now, it is true that wisdom of crowd phenomenon are, is very, very strong and, it's, and these two properties are built up. So when you build algorithms, even the computer scientists, they look to embed these properties of diversity, okay? And uh, for another time, we can talk about random forests and so on. I think, I thought I had a slide here, maybe, maybe not, um, where I, the principles of all of these algorithms really tries to tease out these bracketing ideas, okay, and the expertise. How do we develop diverse enough predictions uh, to, un to benefit from the ensemble, otherwise it is not worth our time, okay? So that's a little bit of intuition. I hope that was helpful, and what Michael is gonna do, he's gonna segue and actually demonstrate how these ideas of bracketing and expertise come to play um, in context that is maybe a little bit more aligned with the rest of the conference related to sports predictions, okay? Um, and I think, Michael, I have, do you want me to pull up my I, slide? I, um, I think I have a, 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 the slide pulled up okay, here, good. I can just. So thank you, um, and uh, enjoy, Michael. Okay. Well, um, Yael is a tough act to follow, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll do my be best here. But it's great to see you all. Thank you for braving the sleet um, coming out early in the morning. Hope you guys, hopefully you guys are well caffeinated. Uh, so... Um, if you have a laptop, if you've been back there working on your email, um, now is the time to, uh, to re-engage in, um, in the workshop. Uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, that's probably not going to be helpful. So we, we have an interactive component. If you don't have a laptop, that's fine. We'll, we'll kind of do this interactively as well with just me kind of driving the code. Um, but we're going to be working through a, uh, a very simple um, Python exercise, and don't worry if you, you know, as long as you have at least a master's degree in computer science, you should be able to follow it just fine. Um, no, no, uh, this is going to be a, a, a low to no code experience, but um, it'll be a, a way for us to, to interact with some real data. So if you guys do have a laptop, I would love for you to take it out and go to the uh, URL you see up there. It's going to take you to a cloud-based server that's gonna have some data loaded up on it, and there will be a prize um, uh, for, the, for the best ensemble model. Um, so please, uh, you know, it, not only will there be a prize, but you will, you will earn the eternal admiration of your peers. I believe I've been getting the authorization, authorization to, um, to offer a professorship at Darden. Is that, is that right, Yael? Okay, no, I'm getting, it's Yael's telling me no, so I wanted to do that, Yael's telling me no. Um, but, uh, but when you go to this, this uh, website, uh, you will see a login. Um, it'll look, I'll show you real quick what it looks like while you log in. Um, it's going to look like this. There's a username field and a password field. The password is ssac23-woc. And the username can be anything, but um, try to make it unique. If your name is Tom, maybe don't log in with Tom. Uh, somebody else might do that as well. Um, append some numbers to the end. All right, I'll, I'll leave this up here for just a second so that um, for those of you who are, who are logging in, um, just a quick show of hands. How many people have laptops with them this morning? Okay, so we've got some. So the, that means your odds are good. If you, uh, if you have your laptop, your odds are good of winning the prize. Uh, and you might be able to do it on a phone or an iPad, um, but, uh, but that's gonna be ambitious. Um, okay. Anybody still need the login details? I can give it a minute, minute more here before we move on. Okay, let's do it. All right, so uh, when you log in, um, you're going to see, let's see here, let me make this a little bit bigger. Everybody read this all right? Okay. Uh, so you're going to see on the left when you log in, you'll see a, a, a couple of folders. You can double click on that SSAC23 and you'll see this um, saber bracketing that IPINB um, and you'll just double click on that and that will open up the code. And then at that point you're ready to go. Okay, 
So like I said, this is in Python, but you know, we're, we're going to be uh, just kind of using it at a, at a very high level um, to get some experience working with a particular data set. And uh, we're gonna be working with, uh, with baseball data, um, particularly we're gonna be working with um, some forecasts for a couple of relevant metrics for pitchers. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say that I suspect that there's the, 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 the crowd uh, probably has a lot more expertise about baseball data than I do. Um, so forgive me if I, uh, if I misspeak in any way about the data. Um, okay, so to run the code, there's this little play button up here. As you walk through, you can just kind of click that and that's gonna run a cell. And you'll see that um, when I ran that cell, there's now a number here, meaning that I ran it. Okay, this first part here is kind of boilerplate stuff for, for Python code, and we're just gonna walk, uh, go right through that. It's gonna set things up for us. Um, the interesting stuff is when we start getting into the data. So what we have here is we've got pitcher level data for two years. Um, we have realized data from 2012. Um, so this is uh, pitcher level data from 2012, um, and we've got kind of a, you know, a, a bunch of, of relevant pitcher stats uh, from the 2012 season. Um, and the important variables we have in our data set are actually predictions from other models. So this is where we're going to be uh, kind of employing the ensembling, the averaging, the wisdom of crowds intuition that Yale walked us through. Um, so these models are, are fairly diverse. In fact, um, one of them is themselves an ensemble. So the, the fans prediction is an ensemble of uh, fans predictions. For two, uh, two different metrics, we have the innings pitched uh, metric and the runs allowed per nine innings metrics, or the IP and RA9. Um, we also have forecasts from uh, the Marcel model, the Rotochamp model, and the Zips model. And all of these use different methodologies, so hopefully they will have some difference in expertise. Right? We're, you know, hopefully by, by taking a, a, a advantage of, of multiple models, with multiple ways that they're doing the predictions, uh, and we'll get some of that diversity that's so important to, to the success of, of wisdom of crowds. So in addition to the 2012 data, and this is where the competition is gonna come in, we have data from 2013, but we don't have the realizations for it yet. I uh, will provide those at the end of the session uh, where you'll get to check your predictions and, uh, and the most accurate prediction will, will win a prize. Um, so in the 2012 data, we have the forecast from the model. Uh, 2013 data, we have the forecast from the model. We still have the forecast, but we don't have any of the other kind of pitcher stats because the 2013 season, we're, we're pretending hasn't happened yet. Okay, everybody with me so far? Great. Um, so we're gonna be looking at various accuracy metrics of these ensemble forecasts. Um, so some, some of these are likely familiar to you. We're going to be looking at the root mean squared error, the mean absolute error, and the R squared for these forecasts. And this is a little function that's just gonna calculate that for us. And we can go through and look at each of our models in turn. And um, we can see that for, I'm gonna primarily be focusing on the innings pitched metric here. Um, for the innings pitched metric, uh, we have an MAE of about 40-ish for most of these models. What does that, for people who are familiar with these error metrics, what is that telling me? Yes. Exactly. On average, we're off by about 40 innings pitched per season. Great. Now, the root mean squared error here is, uh, a good bit larger than the MAE. Again, for those of you who have some experience with, with um, kind of working with these error metrics, what does that tell me? A little more subtle here. Yes. 
Yeah, exactly. There are some outliers here, right? So this root mean squared error is going to penalize big misses a lot more, right? So that means that there are some misses by a bunch. So we're gonna, so, so that's um, something we're seeing in this particular data set, okay? Now, what Yael walked us through is that it's really, you know, really what we wanna see if we're going to kind of come up with a, a successful ensemble model is that the errors are, are different, right? That one model is gonna predict a, a, you know, have a positive error, the other model is gonna have a negative error. So we can look directly at the errors and here we're going to be calculating um, uh, just what the errors are. So, so this is going to be a, a, a list of all of the errors for each of the pitchers for the 2012 season. Um, and you know, in this case, uh, fans uh, overpredicted by 62, Marcel underpredicted by you know eight and two thirds, um, Rotoschamp overpredicted, Zips slightly overpredicted. So, you know, here we could potentially bracket by picking something like uh, Zips and Marcel, right? That would bracket error. We'd have one positive, one negative error. We'd end up with a better forecast overall. Um, and that doesn't always happen, right? So, you know, picture two here. We have everybody is, uh, is under predicting their innings pitched. Um, and then we can look at the kind of the average error here. So this is just taking all the errors and, and averaging them directly. And we see that the average error for RotoChamp, for example, is 23. What is this telling us about these predictions? What's that? Too high, so they're too high, right? So what do we generally call that in a forecast? A bias, right? These bottles are biased, and they're biased positively. So they're all systematically biased upwards. What's that gonna tell us about an average of these models? Exactly, right? Averaging doesn't get rid of a systematic bias here. So there are things averaging can do, things averaging can't do, right? Great. But we also wanna know when the models are likely to be different from each other, right? This is correlation. So we have a little correlation matrix here. And um, we can see that, um, so, so you know, the intersection of the rows and columns is the correlation of those two variables. Uh, so the correlation between the Marcel model for 2012 and the FANS model is 89%. These are highly correlated models. That's to be expected, though. They're all looking at the same picture data, right? This is going to be true of a lot of forecasts. When everybody's looking at the same data, we're going to end up with something that looks correlated. Okay. Um, but we can directly ask, you know, which of these models is likely to have the most bracketing? Likely to capture most of that kind of positive and negative error at the same time. Yes. Yeah, it's the least correlated one. So RotoChamp, Marcel, maybe those are that uh, I think looks like uh, the, the least correlation, 88%. Uh, but they're all about the same ballpark, so it's, it's not one clear um, kind of pair to, to, to ensemble together, right? Great. So let's go ahead and look at um, what the you know, how much bracketing we actually have. In 2012, we can measure that directly. So what this code is doing here is it's just going to basically set a true or a false, it can be thought of as a zero or a one when there's bracketing, right? A one when we do have a, a forecast for the, for the two Fine by me? All right, we're back. Um, so the, if you look back up at the errors, we can see that you know, according to most metrics, 
um, fans is the worst of the, of the models. And again, according to most metrics, um, Zips uh, is, is the best of the models. It's um, best on MAE, not best on root mean squared error, uh, but um, it's, it, you know, we'll, if we're looking at MAE, it's the best of the models. So let's try bracket, you know, seeing how, how often these two models bracket. Um, so once we've calculated for each pitcher whether or not we have bracketing, well, we can just kind of take the average of that, and we end up with, um, with a measure for how often we bracket as a percentage. So we're bracketing 19% of the time in this data set. Means 80% of the time they make the same, the same error, right? Is that enough bracketing? Yeah, but I mean, sh I I'd like a million dollars, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, just a second here. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'd like more, but is it a, pr yes, go ahead. Yeah, it's better than zero bracketing, right? And from Yael's portion of the talk, does it hurt us when we when it doesn't bracket? Is that strictly true? Yes. Ah, okay. So again, fans here is a worse model, right? We've already established. This is an ensemble model of fans' predictions, and it turns out that that wisdom of crowds is not necessarily as good as these uh, handcrafted models. So it is an open question. Does it help us or does it hurt us, right? We're, in, we're somewhere in that two-by-two two quadrant, but we're not quite sure where, right? There's diversity. We're seeing 20% 20, you know, 20 of, the, of the examples bracket. Uh, but the, uh, can I walk now? Yes, okay. The, but, so 80% of the time they don't. Um, and is that enough? I don't know. Let's, we, can, we can just test it and see. All right. So um, th we have 35 examples of bracketing, right? And we can even see what that looks like uh, for the individual pitchers. Here I've got a plot uh, for each of these 35 pitchers. So these are only the examples that bracket. Um, the green dot is the zips prediction. Red dot is fans prediction. Um, the X is the realized value for 2012, so that's the truth. And the blue diamond is the average of the green and the red dot, right? So exactly like that picture we saw earlier in yellow slides, we're seeing that for these examples, the average, uh, the, the for, uh, error for the average forecast will be better than the average error of the two forecasts, right? The bracket is going to help us here. Um, okay, so uh, how does this model actually do? Um, in this case, this is this best and worst ensemble. And what does it mean to actually you know, average these two things together? Well, it's pretty simple. It takes the... Um, uh, two models, multiplies them by a half each, and adds them together, right? That's an average of these two things. We can do other kinds of ensembles. We can average them all together. We could average the top three. Do we need to, so, so in, in this case, I've written kind of a, you know, one half times a fans model, one half times a zips model, and that gives them a straight average of the of fans and zips. And in the other cases, I've still used kind of, you know, just a straight average of each of the models. Is that necessary? What else might you do? Before we look at the performance of these, let's just kind of think about what other things we might be interested in doing when we're looking at these kinds of ensembles.
No? Okay. You. Uh, you're a math, you, you just you finished the data science program. What else might I want to do here? Which model would you think we might want to give higher weights to? Okay. So you're saying chasing the expert and averaging are not the, are, are two extremes of something in between, right? So, so which of the models have we kind of identified as the best? Z zips, right? So maybe we give more weight to zips, right? But let's go ahead and look at, at the performance of these straight averages here. Um, and see how they compare. Um, all right. So we have these various ensembles. And uh, we can see by comparing them to the base models here. Um, so I'm going to use zips as a, uh, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. No. Mm, that's not working for me. Um, oh, well, so let's take uh, the best and worst ensemble as, a, as an example here. Um, so we have an RMSE of 55 and an MAE of 38.7. Um, if we look at just the individual models, well now, if you, if you care about the mean absolute error, the MAE, taking this ensemble of the best and worst strictly beats any of the other models. It doesn't for RMSE, uh, so both um, Marcel and Zips in, uh, are better for if you're looking at RMSE. Uh, but if you're looking at, um, at, at MAE, we've strictly improved even with this kind of simple averaging of a best and worst, right? So if MAE is our target metric, we are in the quadrant where we want to, or a quadrant where we want to um, you know, use the wisdom of crowds even with relatively low diversity, and we know there's a difference in expertise here, right? We still end up in a quadrant where, where wisdom of crowds um, improves. If we look at some, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. It's, a, it's a good question. Is this enough of an improvement? But what does it cost us, right? I mean, an improvement's an improvement, right? Uh, but you're right. Is it going to change our decision making? I think that's a question that's that's worth asking. Um, but we we're not going to quite get to that point of the of the of the discussion in this workshop. But it's a it's a important one to think about as you're going down the line. Does the improvement in your forecast matter? Um, in this case, maybe, maybe not. If you're looking to hire a pitcher, the question would be, did it change my decision about which pitcher to hire, right? Which pitcher to sign? Great. Um, all right. So if we look at uh, the, the performance of all the models, though, well, now we're beating almost all of the RMSE. I think Marcel is slightly lower for RMSE, and our MAE has improved uh, even more. So that's averaging all four models together. And we can look at kind of a scatter plot here. So what this plot is showing us is it's showing us the predictions plotted on the horizontal axis and the realizations on the vertical axis. So what would a perfect model look like on this plot? Who said red line? Right, I want to record participation afterwards. Um, so, <laughs> great, yeah, it, they would all be along this, this line, right? My prediction would be the same as the realization. I would, uh, you know, if I, if I predicted 100, 100 innings pitched for a pitcher over the 2012 season, they'd realize 100 innings pitched, right? What does this plot suggest is actually happening with our prediction? Yes? Systematically overpredict. Why might you systematically overpredict innings pitched? There's a lot of domain knowledge here. Let's bring some of that into it. Yes. Injuries. Expound on that. Why are injuries uh, causing us to systematically overpredict? Yeah. 
Ah. OK, so uh, projections are done assuming no injury. Um, so how could we, if we, were, if, if we weren't interested in, in kind of predicting whether or not somebody has, a, has an injury, what could we do to the data to kind of fix that? OK. So that might be a test if all we care about is, is how these models do on pitchers that don't get injured. Yes? Ah, OK. So you instead take an average here, right? Change the metric we're looking at. Innings pitched per game. All right. Um, now, uh, we have another metric here, runs allowed per nine innings. Is that likely to experience this kind of same bias in our predictions? You're shaking your head no? Uh, what's the reason? Exactly here. OK, so we've got, a, we've got the systematic bias in, in the metric we're looking at. Um, and we've maybe understood a little bit why it's there, right? So now I want to, to um, turn it over to, to you guys. And I want to give you a chance to play around with this a little bit. For those of you who are able to log in, and, and work with the code. And remember, there's eternal glory um, and, uh, and a small prize on the line. Um, and so I'd, uh, for those who don't have a, a laptop here, I want to crowdsource some um, you know, wisdom on ensembling. So you, I, I'll, I'll be driving up here, and you can suggest some changes to the ensemble model, and we can look at how those perform. But then, in just a minute, I'm going to give you guys realizations for 2013 data. So I'd like you to take this code in the notebook and just play around with the weights for a few minutes here. Um, we'll do that uh, interactively as a group. And then while I, I give you, the people who have a laptop, a few more minutes to work on it, uh, maybe we'll take some questions as well. Um, OK, so um, in order to do this, it's, it's simple. We have weights here. If you set a weight to zero, it's like that model is not in the ensemble anymore. It's like it's gone. Um, and then once you're happy with your accuracy here, you can just kind of set the same weights down here for your prediction for 2013, and it will be set up for the final stages of the, of the competition. Um, so as a, uh, as a crowd, um, suggestions on how to set the weights for if you don't have a laptop, you're not working on it, so you don't have anything proprietary to, uh, to hide. Um, what, uh, somebody give, give me a suggestion for some weights for this ensemble, yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so your, your concern is that we might be tuning our ensemble in such a way that does, isn't going to transfer to 2013 data, right? Or when you add in more data. Yeah, it's absolutely a concern. Um, any suggestions on how we might want to, to, to work to, to uh, correct that? Yes? OK, so, so like, you know, maybe we, we don't try to kind of fit our metric super heavy. We, we, we try to be a little bit more robust about it. Uh, spread the weights around. Don't focus kind of on, on any one model, which might, in 2012, you know, uh, work but not, not going forward. Yes? Mm. So that would work great if we were just concerned about overfitting in 2012, right? Uh, so if we, you know, what we could hold out some data, we could try our ensembles, test on 2012 data, and that would help, right? But I'm not sure that that would fully get to your concern. What else might still be happening that that wouldn't? I mean, that's a great idea, and with more data, that's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. But um, what else might we be concerned about for 2000, you know, going from 2012 to 2013? Yes. Different set of pictures. Different set of pictures. Same models, though, yes. Ah, there might be changes in roles, which lead to systematic changes 
and how these models perform, maybe. Yeah. Other things that could be, yes? Ah, yes. So hopefully that's encompassed in the model, but maybe not. Our, another concern is maybe these models change, right? I mean, maybe Marcel introduces some new, you know, new feature into how they build their model, right? Um, Rotochamp uses something, or fans pulls a different set of, a different, a systematically different set of fans, right? Then we're not necessarily comparing like to like. So there's some concerns, but you know, we can, we'll, we'll test that and see. So anybody have some suggestions for some weights here? Let's throw out some weights, because we have four minutes today. Oh, we do have four minutes, you're right. Uh, so yeah, so. Uh, One eighth for which? For the fans, okay. Zips? One half, so you're putting more weight on that, all right. So we have, uh, currently we have three eighths left if we're summing to one. One eighth for Rotochamp. And I'm gonna sum it up to one and go with uh, one quarter, which is two eighths, right? Um, okay, and so here our accuracy is, is RMSE, we're doing quite good. I think we've actually beat the RMSE for any of our previous uh, ensemble models. Yep, oh no, the top three is still a little better, but, um, but we're doing quite competitive. Okay, so I'm going to, just so that we can go ahead and if people were, have been able to um, run the model, I'm gonna put in uh, the, um, the final data set. And if you've been able to build a model on your own, I'd like you to run the, uh, this code down here um, to make sure that my... And while Michael, while Michael is doing that, if you guys have any questions, because I know our time is about up, uh, hopefully we're going to have an hour, but any questions around what, what developed presentation that you still have top of mind? Questions, thoughts? Yes. Yeah, so it's a great question. So I'll repeat the question for those who can't hear. The question was, uh, what kind of other strategies could emerge? Like I can chase the expert from last period, but I can look at the expert, you know, who's performed well over, let's say, the last five periods. Or, and in this case, again, you can look historically over a, a sequence of time. When does expertise fir firmly get established, right? Um, so there, at some point, if you see somebody routinely, and that's where the dispersion of expertise comes into play, if somebody is routinely better, and you can use various measures of performance that may or may not relate to the decision problem you're trying to solve, if you see that they are consistently outperforming the others, then at some point you migrate and you start chasing the expert, yes. And there is no real fast rule as to when that is in terms of history, um, but I will say that there is research that shows that you could select like a top group, up to five, no more than five experts, and focus on them over some extended period, and that might give you some kind of middle ground, benefit of averaging, but only the top people, okay? So does anybody have a, a uh, score? We'll go with MAE for um, their prediction for 2013. Anybody outperform us? Anybody out? I'll, I'll keep the prize. Well, we're working. Uh, we're working. Hold that thought. We're working. Okay, we have one minute to go. Well, hopefully you all benefited from this uh, presentation. Um, it was in two parts, but hopefully you saw the link in how these ideas that kind of started and were maybe fueled by. Um, not only macroeconomics, that's just a domain, but more like expert opinions and subjective expert assessment, how that kind of plays out in the, the algorithms and the ensemble techniques. Um, and, and always be thinking about what the crowd is, what are the models that you're working with, how do you come up with diverse models to ensemble, um, if you're gonna ensemble, uh, in order to benefit from some of these principles. And if, we have, we're here on the break, but there's other things that you can do, of course, to improve the model, to correct the bias, and to pick up on all the things that you guys were asking um, to take it to the next level. Do we have a winner? <laughs>
35.9. Can anybody beat it? Wait. 35.7. All right, all right. This is now heating up. Anybody beat 35.7? Okay, round of applause. All right, round of applause. Well done. Uh, your prize is a, uh, is a $20 Starbucks gift card, um, and, but also the eternal admiration of your peers. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> uh, Thank you, everyone. We'll be around and happy to answer questions. Yeah, if you guys want to work on the notebook, I think they can access it for... I'll leave it up for, a, for you know, a day at least, um, yeah, if you'd like to and play around with it. Oh, if you also want to save the code, just so you have it, uh, you can right-click on this and se select Download as an archive, and it will. You can download this code, download the data, play with it uh, on your own computer if you'd like to. Thank you. Yep. Great job. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.